Hey everybody, welcome back to Final Residence TV and episode number 38 of Van Halen Stories. Today my guest is Tris Mahaffey, all the way from Los Angeles, California. And uh, Tris is an amp builder for the stars. He builds these really cool custom amps that he's uh, he's still doing. And he was part of a band from the uh, the 80s on the Sunset Strip called Striker, who's back together, all original members. And uh, you're opening for George Lynch, right? We are on the 31st of March. Cool. That's yeah. it. We're at, we're, what's it, whiskey? Yeah, so this one's at the Coach House, which is kind of right in my backyard. Okay, cool. Cool. Yeah, looking forward uh, to that. So when you were in L.A. in the, those periods, I mean, what what was your view on Eddie and Lynch in particular? Well, so, you know, at that point in time, you know, Van Halen uh, had already made it. So, you know, my time on the Sunset Strip was in the 80s. Right. So the, the big thing that happened was obviously everybody was chasing that Van Halen dream. Right. You know? right. So everybody had all of their uh, custom guitars, you know, and, and uh, trying to do something that was unique to themselves, but really not. Sure. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Yeah. We, yeah. We, we live in the house that Ed built. We can't escape it. Those doors are locked. Right. Know? Right. I remember that, you know, how, how much he, all of that impact he had right around the period you're talking about 80 and 80 and on, you know, he was so by that time he was in, you know, all the magazines, he was winning the readers polls and yes. all, the, all the guitars were, were pretty well known by this point, even though we didn't have, like we were just saying off camera video is so much to see it more. Yeah. Print, yeah. Uh, print on magazines and whatever. I don't know how, how did you first see the guitars? How did I first see the, the guitars? Like Eddie's guitars, the print, uh, print, print stuff. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The first. Well, so the first my first experience, which is interesting, was um, I was at my house and the neighbor across the street used to take me to all the Rory Gallagher shows that came through. We go drive up to Los Angeles and Rory, you know, Rory, this Rory. That, I mean, he's just an incredible player and a huge influence on me. And mm -hmm. one day uh, this gentleman, Mark Conway is his name, huge influence on me, too, comes over with the Van Halen album. And he puts it on my turntable, and I was like, oh, my gosh, what in the <laughs> world is this? You know? Right. And that was, that was he was the guy who would go to record stores and just buy stuff for the cover. Right? <laughs> right, right. Okay, right. so he brings that in. The cover enough said everything you needed to know, right? Right, right. So, yeah, he put that on. We put that on the uh, turntable, and I listened to that, and I was like, oh, boy, we're in for a new world now, you know? Right. You and I had talked offline, you know, about how eBay came in. It was a similar kind of impact when he when he it was like everybody oh, was like, oh, God, now we got to catch up with this guy, too. It's yeah. Like, right. It's yeah. Well, I would I was playing the Stones and, of course, you know, um, Skinner and all the usual stuff. But, you know, but I, I say this a lot to people because what caught my ear on Van Halen hearing it for the first time was uh, the back vocals. Honestly. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You're right. Because that just it just kicked out. And that it immediately, you know, even though I'm a rock and roll guy, I love the Beach Boys. You know, I love harmony and all that sort of stuff. And that caught my ear probably before the guitar did. Okay. Yeah. And maybe, yeah. you know. Yeah, you know, I was thinking about that too. You just when you said that, it just triggered in my mind that Dawkins had George Lynch's band. Dawkins had that very similar aspect where they had a lot of harmony. They did. You yes. know, because they're Beatles guys. They loved the Beatles. They grew up on the Beatles, and of course that bled over into docking as well, which is like you said, a very unique part of Van Halen with the Michael Anthony and, and they're, they're blend, you know, that's such an important part of the sound of a band is that blend like the beach boys, like you said. Yeah. That high harmony. But anyways, I mean, that's really what started me on the quest for, you know, tone. Right. <laughs> quest and, for tone right. and then, oh my gosh, things got complicated and weird. <laughs> right i think that you know if you didn't grow up at that period you know with those amplifiers that we had you know we were talking about this a few days ago too about how we kind of ran into this the evolution of that tone and that distortion that became today's modern distortion you know how that much that's changed well yeah and i mean the you know i think like we were discussing before is there you know we were all trying to do get the sounds that we heard on the records now this is even before van halen Sure. So we were, we were doing crazy stuff, like taking some amp of some sort, you know, like I joked about a bogan, you know, and running the output right into the face of some PV I had lying around and distorted. Mm -hmm. We're like, hey, 
we're getting there, you know? Right, right. So this, this whole thing with chain daisy chaining amplifiers was kind of early on because that you had no choice. You know, if you were going to get distortion, probably more than you needed, you know, that's kind of the, the way that came about in the 70s. So that was kind of common for people to be doing something interesting like that, which, of course, we'll get into later. But Sure. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, I, I even think about people who talk about, you know, where they would plug into their stereo system and it would it would distort to some degree, you know, through yeah. that, that method, you know, as they were trying to learn how to play or whatever. And they could. Yes. You know, rig up stuff in a way that somehow made something similar to what we were looking for. Yeah. Oh, right. I think, I think everybody plugged into their stereo or some tape recorder <laughs> with on um, record mode. I mean, that's like the most common. Right. Uh, right. I would think about like at the time when I was early eighties, the, you know, the boom box was the thing, right? Yes. I, I would have a couple of them and I would, I would multi-track by recording into one and then playing that back and replaying while the other one's recording me, you know, that yeah. kind of just kind of like totally i don't know how i figured it out but somehow we would figure out these things about amplifiers and and yeah. I mean, i'm sure this goes back to what we're going to talk about a good bit is how eddie it kind of messed with things and messed with things and you know got into all these different variations uh we all know about the the marshall but of course there were fenders before that he talks about that in in uh, one of the articles that he put together well and that's you know that's that's an interesting story in itself because a little background before I got into the amp business is, of course, I was playing in bands like everybody else. But I went to um, Helena, Montana on a vacation ish with my mom. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wasn't the nicest kid on that trip, you know, as a teenager and everything. But anyways, uh, my cousin who was up there took me to a concert to see Jay Ferguson. And Jay Ferguson, you know, Thunder Island fame and all that yeah, right, right, back right. in the 70s, right? Yeah. Well, the guitar player in that band was playing through uh, two basements, through Marshall cabinets, and his tone was unbelievable. I mean, I was like, what in the world? In fact, if you Google live Jay Ferguson, okay, I forgot the name of the guitar player. But anyways, the day after that show... I was at a music store in downtown Helena and who do you think is in that store is wow. the guitar player guy. Wow. So he's checking out amps and guitars and stuff like that. And I'm bozing around and I didn't really introduce myself or anything, but I, they had a Marshall 50 watt. In fact, it's, where is it? It's right behind me, right there. Wow. Same okay. amp. Wow. Okay. Same exact wow. amp. So I saw that and um, they actually had a number of them and, uh, he kind of came over and he said, yeah, he goes, that's that's a good amp. And I go, yeah, I'm thinking, you know, I want to, you know, take that home and, you know, play rock and roll with it and stuff. And this is after Van Halen was out. So in the back of my mind, I'm thinking this is the secret amp. Anyways, he helped me pick it out. OK, wow. And, and I brought it home and sure enough, plugged it into a Marshall 412 cabinet that I bought. And guess what I heard? Or guess <laughs> what I didn't hear? Right, exactly. <laughs> Not enough gain, right? No, right. Uh, you couldn't even get it near right close to what we have heard on these records, like at all. Right? Yeah. I think that's kind of the thing. Like, like when you first get a chance to hook one of those heads up, yes, you realize that back then to even get in the ballpark, you had to crank this thing to yeah. all, you know, hell to get it to even distort it all. You know, I had a oh, yeah. had, I think I had a, I had borrowed some stuff to profile. I think I had one of those crazy, uh, maybe the 200 watt marshals. I can't remember what it was, but it was something. Maybe it was a major or something. I can't remember, but it was brutally clean. Yeah. You know, and actually right. when I profiled it, I profiled it as a fairly clean amp because it was so, it sounded yeah. great that way. Yes. But it was, uh, it was interesting that I couldn't, you know, even get close without blowing myself out of the room. Oh yeah, it, it's just brutal. Now it's awesome. It's sure. incredible, especially on a big stage. Of course. But you know, that's kind of what led me down the road of amp modification. And that's really why I started hunting for people who could help me get there, you know? And um, yeah, I mean, one of the antidotes was that I was the only one in town with one of those. So nobody knew what to do with it. In fact, it's worth mentioning that back then, Marshall exactly wasn't like known for reliability. 
there was, and some of the viewers may remember this, there was a time in the 70s where they were between distribution channels. Right. And uh, these marshals coming in, I, can't, I think they're called CMI marshals because CMI was a distributor. Mm-hmm. But they weren't setting them up properly. So they just weren't a reliable amp, you know. Mm-hmm. So like I was the only one with one, you know, even though, you know, the, you know, you turned on a record, you heard it and everything. But I was always worried that it was going to break on me. So I had like a carbon as a backup. Right. You know? Right. But yeah. you mentioned yeah. that trend when they made that those distribution deals. That was when the 6550s became a tube in the. Yes. Late seventies. I think that was my, mine has the 65 50s in it. The mine 70, too. 77. Yeah. It's a brew. I mean, it's a killer. I mean, yes. you know, it's a killer amp with that, but yep. yeah, that was a, that was a period where they didn't, I think they, they just sent them over without the tubes or something. I can't remember exactly. I, I don't know something like that, but yeah, you know, right. that's what started that. And obviously I didn't get what I was looking for out of that amp. You right. Know? Right. So <laughs> Yeah, so that starts your whole path with the trying to achieve the brown sound, the Van Halen sound, or whatever people call it. They they go around and around about that, but but yeah, yeah. Well, so we can get into it a little bit. Yeah, so go ahead. I remember I, I I had that amp, and a friend of mine moved to Anaheim, and so I'd be driving up and down the freeway to Anaheim with his amp, and then one time he invited me to a backyard party, and a local band, and I think I think it was a band called James Dean. Okay. Orange County guys would remember this, but they were every they were playing everywhere. Right, right. This was in the 70s. And uh the guy's tone was incredible. And I remember after the show, I was not that good a guitar player. I was just still trying to get out of, you know, the earlier stuff, but certainly not at any kind of level that Ed was. But uh I, you know, I'm talking to the guy after the show and I go, you know, I got this Marshall and I'm trying to get it. I'm trying to get that VA Vance Halen sound. And he looks at me straight in the eye. He goes, well, that wasn't a Marshall. I'm like, what? He goes, no, it's Bandmaster. Wow. This is like 1979, maybe, maybe 80. Wow. I'm like, what? No, 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 no. And I didn't accept it. Right and, right, and still to this day, I'm kind of wonky on it. <laughs> right, it right. was so matter of fact on that that I was like, oh, whatever. So I didn't even whatever, quiet, you know. So I went on my way, still trying to get you know the modified Marshall done, and that went. I I met a I later a couple years later. I graduated from high school in 1980, and uh, I go to college, and I take that same amp to a. Uh, a guy named uh, Tony Alamia. Okay, yeah, and, yeah. And he he, uh, I take it to him, and he says the same thing to me. He says, "If you want that tone, you're not going to get it out of that Marshall. It's a Bandmaster." <laughs> wow. So how how do you know that? <laughs> well, he he has proof, which you know is worth talking about at least. Uh, you know, his view of what was going on because he was there and he, okay. he he went to the studio and he supported them with parts and uh because he was a he's a, he was a repair guy. So uh <laughs> I guess I guess what we should say too is that we have talked about this prior and yeah, and that yeah. one of the things that we want to do, we're gonna try to arrange is for him to be on, right? Is that what? yes, he's agreed to come on. Okay, so him and him and I think Martin from uh, the UK, that my buddy Martin, he's been on before, and we might have a couple other guests as well that uh, we drag in and have them. Uh, we'll have this talk about all this this information. Absolutely, yeah. We we need to do that because it's it's just been a strange thing for me all this time. Right, right. You know, uh, to to have this uh, to have this knowledge, I guess. Right. And uh, as you know, a little nervous about even talking about it. So sure, but, that was what was shared. But with you me. know, as as, a, yeah. as an amp builder yourself, you know, all these years yeah. you've been doing this. You know, I don't know much about the Bandmaster, but but and I haven't, and I've never played one. So what's the mm-hmm. basic tone of that amp? Well, it sounds like a country amp. Okay, well, it does. But um, a friend of mine had one, um, and uh, we brought it over. And uh, it was a it was a reverb model, 
Okay. And it also had this little modification that uh, came out during the 70s too, called an ice cube. And what it would do is it was turn it would turn the reverb channel into an overdrive. And it it was effective, let me tell you. It was really effective. Anyways, we plugged that into my Marshall 412 cabinet and I was shocked. I'm like, oh my gosh, here is that. I I use the term wiry. Eddie's sound always to me sounds very wiry, almost single coil. Mm -hmm. But with a lot, there's a mid-range there, which is Marshall-esque, you know. Sure, of course. But it has this wiry sound. It's like if you were going to make a combination of two amps, um, Fender and Marshall, that's kind of the sound, you know, that you end up hearing there. Mm -hmm. And so a, a Bandmaster modified, which is essentially maybe a Mesa Boogie, kind of gets close or maybe even to the super champ that came later in 1984 right All right but those things i you know through a 412 cabinet i hear the sponginess i hear the uh the bloom mm -hmm. that we always hear in ed's tone right we talk about that that, yeah. that bloom is another thing that happens yeah that 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 sustain that happens after the initial yes like it's not feedback but it's kind of like the bloom of a of a feedback but it's actually sustain right more than it's more like a compressor. Right, right, right. Exactly. Yeah. Push it yeah, down but, and let's go. Yeah. Yes. It's pulling out. Right, right. You know, like um, um, uh, running with the devil. Yeah, that's what I think of. The chord gets louder as it's ringing out almost. Right. And right. It could be studio, of course. They're, you know, they're they're recording on Ampex, which is a whole nother story for Sonic. You know, Ampex machine. I had one and it, they recorded on a two inch 24. So, I mean, it's that is an artifact but still you know you hear it when you plug into a you hear i think you hear it more with a modified fender amp than you ever hear with a modified marshall unless the guy who's doing the the modification to a marshall is leaning more towards that way and how he sets up the tone stack or something okay just my view okay? right 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 you know? sure sure but that's you know like martin smith who's been on yeah, he's been experimenting with this whole thing on his channel, and and that's why I ended up talking to him was that he had these these uh, different experiments that he did that were really interesting, and in how to get that bloom and that uh, that yes. kind of edginess that and your wiriness that you said. Uh, yeah, I've heard that. That's not that's been something that's been said on here before. I think Gary Putman may have said that. Maybe oh. uh, Carl Jaw, who you know, both were in Dread Zeppelin were around at that time and both of them had band masters and both of them were using Variax. They they said they were the first guys to ever copy Eddie's rig. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. right. Yeah. Yeah. So that's crazy. Yeah. I know, but you know, all you can take from it is, um, and in my opinion, maybe it was both, you know, as we know, he's a tone chaser. So maybe he did one thing on one time and one thing on another time. I don't know. But I just what I do know is that these guys who were in the know all of a sudden just shot that off to me like I should know that already because <laughs> they're not even well, especially Tony. He's not even a Van Halen fan. You right. know, he's more of a, a, a Dick Dale sort of thing. Surf guitar. He's got a collection of Fender amps even to this day, which is incredible. So the first guy that told you that, do you remember who he was or? I have really struggled with that. Okay. You know, I. There was at that time in Orange County, you had even Lynch was around, you know, you had everybody around. And in Anaheim, Cerritos area, you know, there's a lot of bands. And uh, I'm hoping that sometime I, I I nail that down. Right, right. For yeah. me, that was a very eye opening thing because he was the same way. He was like, well, you're not going to get it because it's not a Marshall. I'm like, oh, you hmm. know, and then. Later years to what we see now is that he had that precious bandmaster in his room that, right? He, that he, you know, yeah. Well, he he talked about it in the guitar fishing audio uh, fishing right. article, right? That was the first time that I remember him kind of going on record about this thing. He might yeah. have said that somewhere else along the line in some interviews, but it, you know, probably got glossed over. People are just still you know so on the Grail Marshall. Do you think yeah. you think it was only the first album, or do you think there was possibly pushed on? So I I think it pushed on okay. and I think it pushed on when he felt he needed that sort of tone because I think his tone changed from song to song, just as his tuning did. Okay. I think he was one of the kind of guys that finds he's playing something and then through a specific 
amp at that time. It's like, well, that's the one I'm going to roll with. Okay. You know? And the other thing that led me kind of down this road lately is that any amp that he ever endorsed or put his name on were high gain. Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't he have put his name on a Marshall? I uh, know. That's why I've Back asked. <laughs> right? I I've mean, asked that question like five times on here. Why, why do you think right. that Marshall never... I know Marshall wasn't in the business of having endorsers or whatever, but yeah. if ever an endorser they wanted to have, it would have been Eddie Van Halen in his peak. And he was in the middle, still using Marshalls through the you know, early 80s. Yeah. So why wouldn't they have jumped on that idea and just, I mean, I don't know. I still don't know. Yeah. So when Tony comes on, I'm going to let him kind of share okay. what he witnessed. Right. Being there. Right. A lot. Right. And uh, supplying specific parts that they needed to keep this thing running. Right. And that's kind of, to me, the kind of the nail in the coffin on at least that part of know, it. Right. Part of it. Yeah. Right. right. I mean, that's the thing. If you, you, you know, you start hearing it from multiple sources, maybe this video will, uh, you know, will help people who are a little apprehensive about talking about it. Well, we've been talking for over a year, right? Right. I know. And I'm saying like, you know, somebody will in the comments might come out. Because yeah, it's so weird what you can learn <laughs> in the comments. Because I will watch yeah. comments on pages about all kinds of Van Halen stuff. And people will come forward who were there and uh, will tell their little stories. And then they just disappear, you know. Yes. And, and it's like, you know, where did that come from? And it, this kind of stuff. But it's great to be able to document this stuff, you know for what it's worth, you know, to, to put it out there and, and then whoever sees it yeah. might be able to help us more. And I think I told you before, I'm, I'm fairly thick skinned, so I'll take the hits. Sure. Well, I, you know, <laughs> and I'm always open to in, anything that, you know, we could find out that's different. You know, that's not, that's not, you know, traditional lore maybe that, that, that might crack the crack, the code. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, I might crack the code, you know, right. I mean, because the other thing we know that Ed, he wasn't actually an electrical engineer, so he would do whatever he wanted to get the job done. So my thought was like, OK, he's plugging into the fender, out of the fender, extra external speaker out jack, which is low level, right in the dang Marshall, maybe, or something like, who knows? You know, maybe he's going through somewhere else, his effects, and I, who knows? But, you know, the fact that it's, the like you say, the folklore is there. But, um, yeah, I mean, you know, it is what it is. Yeah, it's, it's an amazing, uh, like you said, tone chaser. He, he just did so many different things. Mm -hmm. You know, he was always messing with stuff. And we all, we knew, he knew, we knew that he did this his entire life and he never stopped really. Mm -hmm. And I, I know he had a massive collection of amplifiers up there at 5150 and, and it's probably a lot of them still sitting up there. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, who knows what he was playing with because that's what he was known for. Right. Right. Yeah. And I mean, what we do know is the tone vastly changed from the Simmons records. And then when they get over there with Landy, something happened. Right. Something really. Uh, well, I would even say the word comfortable, because when he's recording that first album, he sounds really comfortable. You know what I mean? Right, right, right. He's sending it like never before. So he's feeling good about his tone. He's feeling good about where they're at as a band, I think, because they, they I think they know they're going to slay people with that first record. And they did. So I can't know. remember this for sure, but maybe somebody in the comments will chime in. But when they went to do the Simmons demos in, in New York City, right, this th this would probably I would guess have been on rented gear. <laughs> probably. Yeah. Or maybe yeah. Kiss, Kiss's gear, right? Could have been on their gear. That that record or those tapes sound like a stock Marshall. Yeah, it does, right? It, it, that that whole thing has such a different vibe and and tone. Yeah, yeah. To, to Van Halen one, it's they're not even like they're not even related. It's so different. Not in any way. There's no fire and fury. When Gene talks about it, he talks about how great certain things are and how certain things are better. I'm like, I don't know what he's hearing there, but I yeah, mean, obviously he was close to it. So there's that that thing that happens mentally when you're close to it uh that gives it a little bit more weight for you but but yeah i don't think they sound at all like and there's this the story of them doing their uh audition for bill of coin you know that they go in and they play on kiss's gear and it doesn't go well yeah and yeah. uh and i think this is the comfort thing you're talking about when you hear him on van halen one you know that he whatever he's playing 
it's for him it's the zone yeah, and he's in it, right cool. and it's like but when he was oh. on that previous recording you could just tell it felt stiff like yeah they didn't even sound like the same band and if that's the way they sounded with uh, you know bill then maybe that's why he you know other than the idea that he wanted kiss to focus you know gene to focus on kiss which is an obvious thing yeah until, yeah um you know well, and, and that first record is firing a bottle on every song sure yeah every song yeah in fact i just you know this is funny because you and i were just talking the other night but i i might turn on my mac and those isolated tracks of like jamie's crying came up that they had been just released not long ago mm-hmm. you know and i was listening to that tone just the guitar by itself you know yeah and it had it has an edge to it and that's the, one of the other the bloom and the edge that's different from van halen 2 a little bit even we know that van halen 2 had different a different room i think it was yeah. maybe a different i think he mixed it at a different spot yeah it's hard to remember everything there is to remember because there's so many things but that i think that was it and then um you, you do hear a, a difference in maybe the ambience of the second album do you hear that yeah, I don't hear the, my personal opinion is I don't hear the tone come back till Fair Warning. Okay. That's my view. Fair Warning is when it came back and boy, did it. Yeah. Holy smokes, it came back. So that's, that's always been my view. And of course it could be that again, you know, it could be the the equipment they recorded on. It could, you know, because the studios make a big difference as we're talking about. But I don't think so. I, I think that uh, there was kind of a return to something comfortable. Right, right. You know, there's that yeah. Doug, Doug Messenger interview about Fair Warning when he's there in the studio and he talks about the response to the amp and how Eddie's trying to show him how how the amp just kind of things just pop out when he's trying to do, I don't know if it's tapping or tapping yeah. harmonics or whatever. But, you know, that kind of thing that where you need that kind of like supportive compression yes. or whatever to get, and the thing about Ed's amp and his sounds was that he got all that without any like super distorted, not you know, super clear, like a yes, right? Yeah. And that's kind of what he, Messenger was saying. It wasn't as loud as he expected, and it had this, you know, maybe the bloom we were talking about. You know, yeah. Gave him that air, that push, that yes. Yeah. So I mean, you can get close to it you know with even this amp which is modified um you know with uh variac of course that plays a big part in it uh tubes oh my gosh i mean preamp tubes by themselves every single tube is different and if you cobble together the right arrangement you know you're gonna and even play with the different types of tubes um you will get that but it's uh but yeah, if you if you start to go down the road of distortion, you're going the wrong way. Right, right. Which everybody it's not. Yeah. Everybody talks about why he went that direction with the 5150s. And you know, my experience was I had one for a while, one of the EVH 5150s. And you know, if you mess with the game, you could get it close to that kind yeah. of thing. Um, but it always kind of left me a little cold with it. Like, yeah. like I couldn't put my finger on exactly what it was that at first it didn't bother me, but then later kind of did. It, it, I don't yes. know your ears, how this is, you know, when your ears are exposed for a while, but you get that, you get, you hear, you start to hear that, that, uh, why kind of, yeah, not severely, you know, wide Q, wah, but very yeah. tight. And you hear that in the recordings, even like the thing that just came out, on YouTube where he's playing live, there's still that, that was on that, that version of the amp that I had, the white one. Mm, um, yeah. You kind of yeah. hear that little thing. Now, I know one of the things that he seemed to like was he said he didn't like mid range, but then in the early albums, he, he had tons of high mid, right? Yeah, he did. Yeah. So I don't yeah, know whether that was, a, that was a progression where he started to get away from that mid range and he felt like maybe that helped him out a little bit. Cause you know, there's that story that I just talked about with Ross Hogarth where he's, or you no, know, John Shanks, where John Shanks was trying to mix in more of the vintage Marshall and this blend that they were doing on different kind of truth. Oh, right. Yeah. And then Eddie said, you know, I, the reason I, I went this way is because it made it a little easier for me than having to fight that old Marshall. And right. I, I think, you know, maybe that's why the tone starts to go that direction. Maybe his hearing changed and maybe he just preferred something different. I mean. And that could be. 
you know, well, different songs require different, you know, yeah, right, uh, right, 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 different, different slots. So, like, if you have back in the day with Don, right? If you think yeah. about the drum sounds, the bass sound, and everything else that's going on in that mix, there has to be a certain guitar sound, or the guitar sound is this, and everything else has to be this. You, you're constantly balancing those frequencies to try to yeah. make it work. And for those sounds with a, like, you know, what is a 56 in the kick drums? It's like, it's yeah. like, it's not a high five thing, right? It's a very low five kick sound. It is. Oh, yeah. Oh, right? yeah. It's, it's not anything like Mutt Lang would produce. That's for right, sure. Right, right. It doesn't have any super 800 or 80 or doesn't have a lot of 80 and a lot of, like, a, like a lot of six or something in it, you know, like yeah. 60, a lot of click and a lot of blow in. It doesn't yeah. have that kind of clarity that, that would put it into the guitar range at that point with that sound yeah. well and actually you make a good point because the other thing about you know modern amp designers and i think a lot of them fall prey to this is you know a lot of the amps sound good just when you're playing by yourself of course but when you get into the band situation all of a sudden i'm like how come i can't hear myself you know and it's those mids that are the most important which typically are the same ones that when you're playing by yourself you're like dropping them down Sure. They got to be there, you know, and it's specific mids. Strangely enough, more of the Marshall, you know, that really cut through. But um, true. I remember that when I was doing I told you we were talking about the ADA preamp and how yeah. because I don't know what it was about that that particular preamp, but it was so easy for me to adjust the the mid mid frequency and where where it sat. Yeah, I was able to quickly. I mean, I know you could do this on knob, but for some reason with that, I was able to dial in very quickly where the mid-range needed to be in order for me to cut. Ah. And then when I'd be home now, I would drop that like almost like it'd be plus four live and minus four at home. Yes. You know, and I the, you could you that's the way I did it. I always use the more cutty mid-range thing live to hear it. Yep. And at home for comfort, you know, for that. I don't know what he did in the studio. That's the thing, you know, because what, you know, I mean, is he, he didn't use headphones, I don't think. No. I, well, I think he had the be added benefit of parametric EQ on the board. So sure. he could, you know, he could find that spot. I mean, if the band's playing, he can kind of just, you know, tweak it into it. It's like, oh, there it is. But that's not necessarily going to work when they take it, you know, uh, out in the room. Sure. So, um. Yeah, I know it's uh, it's pretty wild subject. It is. There's so many. There's so many roads down. You know, pass with the sound in general because, like I, we were talking about, you know, when you're at home, you know, even this little guy over here. I don't know if you can really see that, but that's mm -hmm. the, the Yamaha uh, THIR. Okay, and it does that. It does it. Does the brown sound so well? But it's it's such a mid cut thing when you're here. You know. Yes. And it and it it's forgiving because you know, the more mid cut it is, the more, the less the pick attack and that gets in the way of your, you know, your sound. Yeah. Right. Well. Yeah. It's yeah. Well, like you you kind of tend to go that way because it's comfortable and you feel you like do. oh I, I'm playing better because it I don't hear the imperfections as much because it's kind of takes away those frequencies a little bit. I can tell you ninety percent of. Uh, the guitar players I know who are um, who are well known and I've built amps for, yeah, um, crank the mids, yeah, and they turn down the gain, right? Mids are up and the gains down, and in fact, my amp probably has way more than they they ever need, right? You know, they just barely crack the gain. I'm like, well, there you go, there it is. And, you know, especially a couple of them, uh, a couple guys that are really good at doing the Van Halen thing, they they get that sweet spot pretty quickly. And the, it's usually with that, uh, especially on my my app, it's usually with that. Um, I only have one tone control on my app. <laughs> OK, yeah, yeah. I'm one right. tone control. And then recently, since it was kind of asked for, I added one more, which I called wide ratio. And that also is nothing more than pinpointing a certain mid that needs to be there. But everybody still cranks that to 10, <laughs> even though I put it there, maybe for my own, own comfort. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I do it too. I just leave it on 10, but every now and then with a certain cabinet, like I can mimic uh, with that control, I can mimic a, what a vintage 30 would sound like, you know, from a, uh, a well, a, 
a, a real green back from the early days, not any reissues, but the real stuff. I can, you know, I can with that that uh, center frequency, I can dial it in. Okay. But still, that mid range is just like we're talking. It's just it's everything, you know. Right to that sound. Yeah, yeah. Um, that that amp. Now you. Uh, well, let me say this. I just thought of this about Pete Townsend because he was one of your clients, right? Yep. Okay. I, and I don't know why I just thought of Pete Townsend, but I, besides the fact that you work with him, um, the fenders he uses, the sound you're talking about, how you you, you know it's more about it's less gain, right? Yeah. Or mids. Yeah. When I think of Pete Townsend, I can think classic, you know. Yeah. Well, high right. watts. Right. You know? He didn't like Marshall because they distorted. It, so he goes high watt. You know, so and that's so I, I early on, I was building two amps. I was building one that had no or very little gain and then one that was nutsy cuckoo gain for everybody who wanted that. <laughs> right. Right. So you were saying you were building these amps for uh that had a lot of gain yes yeah and then uh i also built one with a lot less gain because no one needed that they they would prefer uh less gain and more sting if you will you know more of a, a cleaner sound and maybe they might be using pedals too that's required that you know but i was saying that the british guys that have been my customers they were all about that and then you know, because they're probably used to playing through Marshalls. You know, they didn't need all that. They put a Marshall on three and they're good to go. Right. Right, right. Yeah. So that little amp, show, show that little amp that you built. This is kind of like you You tell me, I kind of knew this, but you, you were telling me that this is kind of what got your business really ramped up. Yes. And you, so, had, this, you had this period when you were in Stryker, right? Through the 80s. Yep. Explain that, that progression from Stryker through this amp and how that became this big connection point to Pete Townsend and all these other artists and some of the other people, some of the other people that you work with. Yeah. So it, it, uh, it basically came because I'd had enough of, you know, trying to make it per se. Sure. And uh, around the nineties, I shared the story that everybody else has, you know, right. brunch came along and killed us all off. And, you know, I was, I was at 30 years old at that time. So, I'm like, I got to keep my foot in the business somehow. You know, I can't just like leave forever, you know? Right. So, yeah, I mean, what I did is I basically uh, sat down for a few years with my Marshall, with the modifications that I had done. Mm -hmm. And I uh, worked on a circuit. It had to be at least two years. And by doing that, I'm sure a lot of amp designers and guitar players relate right to this because I would build it and then I'd walk away for a day or maybe two weeks, hey, maybe in a month. And I'd come back in and I'd plug in. And I'd go, close. And I did that for a long time until mm -hmm. I finally came up with the circuit. And that included um, the preamp circuit, the transformer, the speaker, of course, and the output stage, which I, uh, I chose to build. And what I came up with, and at that time, it was a rarity as no one was building a small little tiny tube-based amplifier right right okay uh that would satisfy the traveling musicians see we got tubes back here and everything mm -hmm. and this thing this is called the little on a lay that was the first product and i put that in finished guitar player oh my gosh the phone lit up people needed them they wanted them and what was beautiful about the product is is it wasn't to take the place of something else. I mean, I guess you maybe could argue the pig nose, but it wasn't way beyond the pig nose, which I actually love the pig nose, they're cool. But it it satisfied the traveling musician, the touring musician with an amp that sounded as good as his rig on the stage, just smaller, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And one of the kind of the theories I had was, hey, when you're in the studio, like right now I got, you know, NS10s, I got everything in here, well, I can mic up an amp in the other room and I'm listening through my near fields and it sounds like the amp, right? Mm -hmm. So why doesn't a practice amp sound that way? Right. So that sent me on the course of building, if you will, a near field practice amplifier. Wow. So wow. everything was hand wired, even the speakers handmade. So the speaker wow. uh, at that time I had a builder. Now I have a, a factory that builds it for me, but that back then even the speaker was handmade just to, 
you know, a wide range type of speaker that would get that tone. And the phone rang and I started selling these things and everybody started hitting me up. You know, my website, I hate to be a name dropper, but the website shows everybody that's, well, a portion of everybody that's purchased them over the years. Right, right. And it, it still sells uh, word of mouth. I don't advertise. Uh -huh. um, now, I am considering doing NAM next year for the first time because actually I, like others, or unlike others, I actually like the NAM show now. I think right. it's freaking cool because all the small builders get to be there. Right, right. You know, but that's that's started that whole thing on the little lamps. And then uh, I teamed it up with a rotary cabinet. I got a little miniature Leslie wow. that goes with it. And uh, I was the first guy to put a spring reverb tank in a, I don't have one here, um, in a pedal. So it has spring in there, which most people thought was a retard because, you know, you hit it and it would boing, right? Right. But I used a soft switch and you usually leave it on anyways. So you know, that product uh, was built as well. So I had I had some products and I, I got to doing pretty well. I mean, I had full page ads in Vintage Guitar Magazine for a while. And it's just one of those things that's been around. Well, 20 plus years later, um, they are now manufactured underneath my name, Mahaffey Amps. Right. The site is mahaffeyamps.com. And I've branched into doing finally a head and offering a full 45 watt you know, head out, which is what I've been playing through with in my own group lately. So, so you're, so yeah. you're, tell me about, tell me about the, the sound of this thing. What, what is your, I mean, is it a Van Halen thing or type thing or what? I think it is. I think it's a blend of a Fender and a Marshall. Okay. So that's <laughs> kind of what you went for, huh? Okay. That's what I went for. I went for what I've heard. Okay. I did not go for what I was told with, how they were wired and you know bright caps and all that sort of stuff no i'm using my ear right that's what i'm doing and then so are my customers so okay. whether or not it emulates ed's tone is really not the full game here what it is is providing an amp that's extremely simple in design less amount of components to get from the pickup to the speaker and do it cleanly and reproduce without a whole lot of, uh, you know, circuitry between. And uh, that's really what these amps are. And they they always have been that way. So, you know, the, the reviews of these things over the years, um, the players who use them mm -hmm. kind of speaks for itself, right. you know. So yeah. I'm lucky. I'm very lucky. So the gain level is what? How much? Um, so compared to another amp? Yeah, just kind of like, is it high? It does it do high gain or is it? Yes. But I would say um, only because I, I played one not too long ago, it's about like the blue channel on the 5150, okay. but maybe even a hair less. Okay. About there. But yeah. it, the other th the difference is that I hear on a lot of other production amplifiers out there, I, I always hear this kind of weird, I don't know, it's kind of a high frequency. Uh, I don't, I don't know what it is. It's like a glass breaking sort of thing above the note right, when right. it's full on distortion. I hear this weird, you know, I don't know what it is really, but mine don't do that. Right. 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 I've heard that, you know, Dave Freeman's brought that up. There's a, um, that, that sound that you're talking about, the glass yeah. breaking sound. And, um, yes, it's a, he said, what does he say? I forgot how he says it, but it's something like that. He, he, that's how he describes it. Yeah. Well, it's kind of like makes your eyes bleed. <laughs> All right. Uh, right? You, we right. don't need that. You know, right. no. Well, maybe from time to time it might be fun, but I mean, seriously, maybe do get that another route. But right. um, yeah, so that's that's what that amp is about. It's um I've built um three uh -huh. and two of them are out uh being used uh and tested and they're putting them through its paces. I, I send them out to the, friends of mine and let them just beat the snot out of them. I'm doing that. You know, I'm brutal on them, throw them around, play them on 10, you know, what's the tube, what's the tube compliment on this amp? So my designs are always been the same, which is, uh, I use two 12, a X type tubes. Okay. Okay. And hand wired. And then I have my own tone stack that I came up with. It's very mm -hmm. simple. 
-hmm. And then I drive a uh, an output stage, which is not tube. It's actually a class A uh, transistor output. Okay. And a lot of people have called foul on that until they hear it. Right. Because the difference is, is that all I'm doing is taking that preamp tone. And in, in miniature, really, it's almost like a full-on tube amp in itself. In fact, the out, the second tube could drive a transformer, and drive a speaker. Mm -hmm. In fact, my quarter watt is that way. I sell a quarter app version of the amp, and that takes away the solid state stage and just put a transformer in there and drive the speaker. And there's plenty of like videos on the quarter watt out there as well. But that's been the design. And most of it was because I didn't want to get into high voltage and I didn't feel it necessary. Okay. Especially after years of slaving amps. Right. Even my Marshall into a load box and then into some power amp. That's what this is in miniature. Right. That's all. That's what this is. Yeah. So, you know, the, the, the tricks to the tone come into how your circuitry is. And uh, transformers play a huge huge part of this power transformers right. not output transformers power right. train so the reaction of that which again seems that no one ever talks about right um, is what enables this thing to sound the way it does and right. it's it's unique it's definitely unique i was that makes me think of this power amp that i used to use you know when the mp1 came along they they introduced it with this thing called a bipolar tube or not tube amp is a bipolar solid state amp or whatever it was yeah Sure. I don't, I don't know anything about the circuitry in it, but I do <laughs> yeah. know that when I when I would go back and forth between their tube hybrid power amp, which I have the Microtube 200, which is the front end stage is tube in the back end, like you said, yep. uh, solid state. There's a difference in the low end response as far mm -hmm. as the tightness goes, and it's I almost prefer that solid state output. Yeah, and the pre would be in you know, tube twelve eight seven, and the output yeah. being this, I don't know why, but for me, it had that super tight bottom end that, that I think we've gotten a little close to, you know, when you hear the Van Halen record, I don't do, I mean, to you, do you hear like that bottom end not being tight? Cause we were talking about flub the other night. Right. Yeah. And how that, how that was a thing. And for me, the Van Halen sound has a tight bottom end. Right, very tight. Very tight. All right, right. So the edge on the how how quickly the the bottom in response is what I'm talking about from that particular amplifier that I loved. Yeah, it, it gave me that super tight. It made me when I played it, it was so much easier to play because it was accurate to me. Yes. Yeah. Well, it, it it's a it's a good point because the other thing about Eddie's tone on the first album is everybody kind of tends to think it was really bassy. I don't yeah. think it is. I think you hear the Michael Anthony's bass helping that lower end, but sure. his actual tone was not. And one of the ways to eliminate that flubby is to not give it that low frequency in the first place or pick one in the EQ that is not flubby, where it'll flub a, a typical 12 inch speaker, you know. Right. So you and I talked about that offline yeah. that, that you know, yeah. if, you, if you depend on where you set that frequency you can you can bypass that sound that that's right flow. yeah yeah that, yeah that's a big part of to me van halen's sound in general and and even as he's gotten to the more modern amp that's my main say that tight end and that tight low end is why i think the metal guys love that thing is oh yeah because it yeah. just it does that thing you know and they have that super they're able to be super articulate with the low end and so oh. much of what they do is based on that you know yeah hence jason newstead being mixed out of one of those records <laughs> right right you know it's right. like <laughs> right super yeah. tight low end right yeah yeah <laughs> and, and that really i mean when you think about the, the kind of like the genesis of that kind of gent, I guess they yeah. call it, uh, it's kind of beyond me, but that thing started with kind of with Edward with that super tight low end, right? Totally. And oh, then yeah. you get into the into the seven string and Vi, you got to have a pretty tight low end to deal with a multi, you know, seven string and beyond. Oh, yeah. And so now you get to this thing where you've got all these new guys, you know, the periphery or whoever. And they have this super focused low end that is like, uh, it's like another level of that. 
incredible. That well, that's you know that's where amp design has totally changed from the seventies and even the eighties. Yeah. I mean, you know, Soldano was the guy who brought out an amp that was out of the box, just would rip your face off. You know, right. he was the first one to do that, really. Right. I guess you could argue Mesa was in there, too, but not for the rock guys. You know, sure. that didn't happen until the rectifier years later. And, you know, my experience is because my experience goes back to the 70s because I'm an older guy. You know, right? I remember the transition and you going to Guitar Center or whatever brick and mortar store just to hear a new amp to see if it had um some sort of overdrive or distortion or whatever that was usable you know right it took forever <laughs> for that to happen i know you know we, we discussed this the other night about the super champ but then the how yeah. how that amp you know you're talking about the ice cube and all that yep real quickly on the super champ you know i had said to you that that was the first amp that i had actually experienced that sound with right yes because it was the first i i you know i wouldn't say it was the first small amp that i ran across that had that kind of thing you know yeah and you had mentioned this ice cube thing explain this thing and, and the correlation between the super champ and this ice cube component <laughs> well i'll i'll keep it as non-political <laughs> as i can amp okay. political Okay. But what basically happened is, and this came up again lately because I actually met the inventor who's like two miles from my front door uh, of the ice cube. And what it was, was you could take a fender, any fender, any fender, which yeah. actually might be an interesting subject, okay, with reverb. And you can take what would normally be the, the driver stage providing signal to the tank, okay? Yeah. Very high impedance there. Okay. Coming out of the tank, well, there you get your wonderful reverb. But what if you took the tank out of the circuit and took that same uh, amount of gain, I guess we'll say, and just put it right back into the circuit? Right. Essentially, that's what the ice cube did. Now, it did have some sort of passive circuitry in there, but it literally looked like an ice cube because it was made in an ice cube tray. <laughs> that's, that's a cool story. Yep. So it had two RCA jacks sticking up and then whatever filter network he put in there. And then he poured the goop in there, let it harden. And then he put a sticker on it wow. and he, he sold that to the, to anybody. Wow. You know, anybody who wanted to high gain their fender, you know, and it works. It's in fact, I ordered one. I found one in Germany. I ordered one. Of wow. course, now everyone's going to go out and buy them. Right. Right. Be, be, but um, but having said that, my half the amps might reissue that thing. So well, that's good. That's people. cool. That's yeah. cool. So what year was that that he did this? Oh, that was in the seventies. Wow. So okay. Yeah. yeah, I'm running across all this stuff with the with these modifications that I never even knew about from the seventies that were <laughs> that were kind of like the precursors to well, trying to add gain. Yeah. And, and trying to get more out of those amplifiers all the way back. Before Eddie, I guess I'm. Yes, I mean. Oh yeah. Oh, of course. Because we like you know before Eddie, we were always trying to get more gain out of an amplifier. That's what I was alluding to earlier by taking some amp and being dumb and just taking the speaker output and shoving it right into the front of your amp. Mm -hmm. You know, it works as long as you didn't turn the volume up too high. You know, or a headphone jack on a Bogan PA amplifier or a or a Heath kit or a Lafayette. I mean, everybody was trying to do that daisy chain stuff mm -hmm. before Van Halen. This was very common, okay. especially in SoCal. I mean, every guitar player I know was monkeying with something like that. So what was like, you know, in the seventies prior to Van Halen, mm -hmm. who would be, you? are we, who would be like the tone guy at the time? Is it Ted Nugent? Who was it? Billy, well, yeah, I think everybody loved Ed, uh, uh, Ted, but you know, we kind of wish he'd play something other than the Birdland. Sure, you know? sure. But certainly, you could not argue that tone. Right. Um, but probably, you know, I would think, um, well, Boston, right, right. Even, even though it was more of a mid rangey, right. But you you couldn't get that with anything commercially available. Okay. Right. Um, if you go even further back. I've been doing a deep dive lately on mountain, right. you know, Leslie West tone was wicked. You know, that was killer. I mean, even really, um, 
there were some good tones. Bad Company, of course. Oh my gosh, Bad Company. Right. Um, I'm sure I'm forgetting some. Well, even you know, Journey. Neil Sean was playing through Marshall, and his tone was fiery. You know, his mm -hmm. tone was happening. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Who else? Uh, you know, we Jimmy Page. Everybody loved Jimmy Page, but everybody knew that he was running his Marshalls on either two or three max. So that wasn't that wasn't doing this. You Why know? was he doing that? I don't really know anything about that. Well, because he's not a game guy. He's okay. you know he wanted them clean. Okay. So um, scorpions. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, scorpions for sure. With Those early, early genre. Yeah, and even after the fact, I mean, um, scorpions had great sound oh okay here's a here's another one kiss yeah kiss was 100 watt marshals listen to a live two okay shock me right and listen to that amp and you can tell that thing is freaking loud sure it is loud and it's distorted it's not ed's super type distort but it's it's big and right. massive so right. I th sure I could think of more. I'm probably missing something, but um, that's the seventies. I mean, like, you know, like you and I were talking, you know, 77, the plane goes down with Skinner where everybody was a Skinner fan. We we're all waiting for the tour, you know, street survivors was out. It's like, everyone was going to the concert and had bought tickets and everything. Right. So that was, but no one was really going for, you know, Ed's distortion. Cause we hadn't heard it yet or Ed's tone. Right. We didn't hear it till after. And that was kind of a, awakening yeah when you think about skinner do you think about those guys uh rustin and alan collins you oh. know they're, they're pretty pretty distorted you know leads for that period and um they had that they had a fiery tone you know they did. yeah and so yeah, yeah ed sound was just a a, a a another you know notch up from that you know it was and if you see the live things you see that from time to time alan collins would have a marshall up there Mm -hmm. You know, there was always some sort of Marshall early four input GMP up there. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, those PV Maces had a tone all their own. Now, I we talk about flub. I always hear like a little flubby in the Skinnerd sound, but it is the Skinnerd sound. Sure. And it's it's I'm a huge Skinnerd fan. Yeah. yeah. Huge. huge. Yeah. Yeah. You know, if, if someone said, what albums are you going to take on a desert island? You might be surprised at what I say, you know, but uh, Skinnerd was it. It was it for everybody, and the tone and the guitar tones and the the playing was still just unbelievable. Especially Street Survivors. I mean, hit their peak on that, and uh, I, you know, I still have the news clip clippings of when that plane went down, and I still, you know, chills to the spine just even thinking about how that changed my. I graduated in eighty, okay, so that was my era. That was my high school years, which are always very informative. Sure. Um, oh, Thin Lizzy. Sure. Tone. Yeah, right. So that they were, you know, 70s. And, yeah. um, you know, that Gary Moore and and of yeah. course, um, all the guys that were in the, the iterations of Th Thin Lizzy. I mean, they all had great tones, different yeah. to each other, but the great yeah. tones. Yeah. But and the thing about Van Halen was, is that was the first record I probably really climbed on to because it was like one guitar bass and drums well i was a rory fan so rory one guitar of course he's a singer bass and drums right but yeah. that rory tone is awesome but it's nothing like the intensity eddie could carry he didn't ever need to overdub anything he really didn't he did but he didn't need to you know right. Right. Yeah, and he didn't do rhythm guitars on there, maybe a few tracks. Right. Yeah. But it was I, I don't think it was needed. Take it out. You know. Yeah, I think maybe you're right <laughs> about the whole thing with Eddie and and why he kind of informed that trio, power trio, at least musically underneath any of the bands in the 80s, you know, we that became a prototype, you know, for so many bands that have the guitar player that has the big sound and then a band wrapped around it with the great songs, the pop songs. Yeah, that became the the thing. I mean, but when you think about like a foreigner, or you're thinking yeah. of, uh, sticks, you have you know multiple instrumentalists in that band and a lot of layer and a lot of detail. But yet, for some reason, with Eddie, you you didn't miss it. 
No, you didn't. You you never did. Right. You never did. Especially Actually, it was so big, you know, such a big sound. Do you think like for, you know, this has always been a point of contention with Van Halen and the bass sound of the records. You know, do you think that that Don was intentionally making room for Eddie's sound with Michael's bass? I think so. I I think that that was a, a huge part of it with giving him his own speaker. And maybe he was smart enough to know <clears throat> that people, when they hear this, they're going to they're going to hear something that they're not used to hearing that level of musicianship, especially at that time, because it was I mean, I when that album came out, I struggled for years to try to figure out what he was playing. Right. And it was only from friends who would see them in concert and come back and show me. And I'm like, OK, didn't think that's how that went. You know, like I learned Eruption with a cassette deck and you know years later boy not even close tris you know you did a pretty good job for its time but i think they knew probably in that production at least landy did i think it speaks volumes when you hear the story where landy went back in on a weekend and remixed that whole record right right yeah yeah sure did he he knew it he heard something and he's not talking either so right you know this is this is the impact of that record and that production. Right. Very, uh, yeah. I would like to know that from him, whether he had, he thought through, you know, maybe I, uh, the whole idea of let's give them the space and yeah, how, how he was going to put that together. I mean, when you think about Doobie brothers or something like that, you don't, <laughs> you don't think of that, you know? Yeah. You don't right. think of that kind of production. I mean, you do hear his production skill. Yeah the same skill but you don't think of the way that they framed van halen i know yeah it's yeah. A, it's a very interesting first that first album in particular how they put that together with what chamber they used all of the all of the little detail that don did I, you know i just don't think people realize the impact of his his handiwork in that particular situation well and it's no more shown than when you can play van halen one on any stereo even a terrible one yeah or even listen to it through a phone speaker or whatever and it's still intense right 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 doesn't matter doesn't matter yeah it's it's an amazing album and that production you know yeah the whole thing you know it it just trans it's like through time you like you said i heard it just i think it was last night or night before just walked in somewhere and heard, you know, ain't talking about love. And I thought, man, it just <laughs> always seems like it's new. And it's it's never, true. ever aged. I mean, yeah. it's, it's strange because it, it transcends the, that production work, even with those crazy, you know, 56s and the kick drums and all this stuff. Yeah. When you solo out, it still sounds awesome. Right. Yes. <laughs> like you solo out the drums. It's, it's amazing. Yeah. Oh, I know. And it's just incredible, the tones and stuff he got, especially for the time and and how he would, you know, like I was just, I just heard the, uh, you know, Doobie Bros the other night. Um, and I was like, man, there's the, he's got that, he had it in ear. Yeah. Amazing yeah. ear, you know. Yes. Um, for guitar tone too, because if you listen to some of those Doobie Brothers things, you hear him crafting out very similar kind of cutty, yeah clear productions that well you know and you gotta hand it to him so you you, you really got me yeah literally sounds like uh something's been added to the guitar like either somebody sliced up some speakers with a razor blade that was really popular back then or they're driving the board hard or even they're driving the tape machine hard but something gives it that ripped paper sort of tone Right, and right. I think that was on purpose, you know. But that's the one that we always try to emulate, right? Sure. What sends us into super distortion land when we shouldn't be there in the first place? You know what I'm saying? Right, right. So, I, I do use that yeah. as my reference. I didn't tell you that, but yeah, you use really got me as one of my references whenever I'm working on an amp. Sam, yes. you know, it's right. one of the first riffs I go to because it, it has. When I hear it, I just I'm so focused yeah. on that sound of that particular riff in that particular production yeah, yeah. 
And then, of course, the ain't talking about love is sort of the next test for the clarity of the of the muted strings and mm -hmm. the upper tone of it. How hey, how it was not brutal to your ear, but still cutty. You know, yeah. just a magical you know number yeah. of factors that go together with that sound. You know how it, how it has the clarity and articulation at the top, yet it's not brittle. Yeah. You know, when you get up high. Yes. Right. Yeah. I would lo I loved, I think this is one of the things his mom, <laughs> his mom used to tell him, you know, what's with that high, right. high crying sound, right? right? Yeah. Crying sound. Yeah. But when you think about that tone, it had that, that I wish when I've heard that, I go back and listen to the records and I think, yeah, it kind of does have that. It's sort of like, it's sweet though. It has a sweetness to it, yet it still stands out. And you could think about any of the guys, you know, I have even up here on the wall, you know, Bill Collin or somebody like that. They have something similar to that, but that first record has something different. Yeah. There's well, the yeah. ultimate clarity, you know, yeah. we're all shooting for that thing, that ultimate yeah. clarity at the top without being brittle, that tight bottom end and a mid range that, that cuts. Yep. And yeah. why is that so hard to, you know, you're an amp designer. Why is that so hard to, to achieve? I'll go ahead and say, I think I got it. Yeah. Well, you I think it. I've always had it. I, I, you know, I play it. So um, I am probably the only guitar player you have ne ever met mm -hmm. that never looks for another amp. I quit looking for another amp in the mid nineties. Wow. I've always played through my own rig and I, I, I try other amps. I'm like, eh, this is kind of cool, but that's doing this that I always heard on this one, blah, 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 blah. Right. So I'm probably the only guy who's happy 100%. Wow. With my sound, one hundred percent. Yeah, that's and that's just me. That's not saying everybody. Although you know, I you know, I've got some pr pretty well known friends that are using them to say the same thing. But then again, you know, to each his own. I mean, you know, that's why you know the the amp that I've built, this new one especially. You know, I want to send it out into the world and let people try it and see what they think. Yeah, and it's gonna it's gonna get its fair shake if. It turns out to be a plane crash. Well, that's fine. I still like it, but you know, I right. You know, I'm good either way. Right, you know? right. It is. It is such a, a magic recipe that we have worked on yes. the, the, yeah. the thing for years. Now, one of the things that we've discussed, and you you have alluded to throughout this discussion so far, is this whole uh, slaving amplifiers together thing. Yeah. Um, explain. To anyone who doesn't know, and, and I'm one of them because I haven't done this. We've, I think we talked about me doing it, and I talked to Martin about it. In a minute, <laughs> right. cause, cause I don't know how to do it. I mean, I'm afraid to do it. Yeah. yeah. So what do you do, and how can you do that? And what does it do? Well, how can you do it, and how can you do it safely? Exactly. No idea. Okay. No, I'm kidding. Now, uh, well, basically what you have to do, and there's plenty of devices that will do it, like the hot plate and, you know, all these amp uh, attenuators, if you will, okay. that are out there. Yeah. They're going to take that amp, you know, the 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 set amp that you're going to use as a preamp, really, that's what it's becoming. Okay. And uh, you're going to run either its speaker output or its line level out if it has one. It may need a load. Uh, but you're going to take that down to instrument level, which is way down, Okay. And then you will be able to safely, and I'm saying this is not for anybody to do unless they know what they're doing or have a qualified tech, because I don't want to be on the hook for somebody doing this. Right. But or or talk to the manufacturer of the load box or the or whatever device you're using. Um, you simply would use that head or amp just as you would a distortion box or an overdrive pedal. There's no difference. Right. There's but you have to get you have to get down the level to the right level you to, do. Go, to yes. go on the front. Yeah. Now, having said that, on a tube amp, that output can be pretty darn hot. It really can. Mm -hmm. um, to go beyond instrument level, not much, but it can be. It can be a little hotter. And uh, what you know, it, essentially, what that really happened is for amp manufacturers is they just started automatically adding a gain stage inside an amp to do kind of mimic that same thing. That's right. why like the, the Jose amps that we've seen have an extra gain stage. Well, essentially that's the same thing as taking a, a amp and a load box 
okay, and and putting into the face of your amplifier. Now, here's where it's different: is that an, a, a head is literally a whole amplifier. You know, it's a preamp, it's a power amp, it's multiple transformers, um, it's tone circuits, it's tubes, it's all of that. So, by all means, you're going to get a lot different of a tone by doing that. You're actually going to replicate the sound of that amp through the through the slave amp, okay? Mm -hmm. With a little extra maybe sound or uh, tonality of whatever that power amp is. When okay. we're talking, which is what we're obviously talking about, which is Ed, mm -hmm. which is I hear... I hear a combination of both amps when I hear his tone. Mm -hmm. I hear that wiry Fender basement or bandmaster. Mm -hmm. I hear it. Mm -hmm. I feel it. Because when you play, you know, leads through a Fender amp, they are right there on your pick. They are so right there on your pick. But then we hear this kind of Marshall-esque kind of mid-range thing too happening. Mm -hmm. And that's what I've that's what I've always heard when I kind of you know got thrown the bone it's like well it's not a marshall it's a bandmaster i'm like oh really ah yeah. so <clears throat> to to the viewers watching the way to do it is to simply get a load box a good one you know a reputable name that would put an instrument level output that's how you would do it right right yeah that's and, it. and so the so it is like a, a distortion box in front how totally. much how much i mean d does that I'm trying to think when you're going through a gain circuit and you increase that, does it pass, it just passes it on like it's a power? Oh, yes, uh, absolutely. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, so the, the balloon we talk about is, you know, Martin that I talked to um, Smith from the ink from England, mm -hmm. he was, we were talking about the balloon and, yep. and that whole thing, <laughs> you know, and, yeah. um, and he, his theory was that it was this, the slaving of the amplifiers was was because he was doing it in his video i believe that's what well i mean i was that's why i got in touch with him so i was like man okay so tell me about this so that's you know where i started oh, down this yeah. path with you, you know you and i had talked too so yes. i had had that all going through my head through this last year and uh and that's what he was saying he said you get that thing on running with the devil you do where it blooms you get the bloom because you're you're probably putting more gain than you really should into that preamp section or whatever amp you're slaving to. Yeah. And it has to be a tube amp, by the way. You can't do it with a solid state amp. Right. I wouldn't think. Um, but um that bloom happens. Yeah. And it's probably related to overgaining a preamp. <laughs> you know. Sure, sure. Well, of course. <laughs> you know, it's 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 not liking that much. Right. Well, that's what Ed, Ed always said. He was trying to blow things up. I mean, even yeah. you know, he was working on his own gear. He was always trying to torture it to death. And uh, I think he did a good job. Well, I know he did a good job of torturing. Right, that's right. That's to come. But um, yeah, and the other part of it, whatever. Let's just say you have an amp that you're going to use as the preamp. You have to treat it nicely too. It won't like you if you don't treat it nicely. Okay. And, uh, yeah, so bad things can happen there that cost right. you money. Right, lots of money. Right, right, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's wild. Yeah, the the whole amp thing's crazy. So let me ask you this about Van Halen in particular. When you were a kid, you, yeah. you heard the first album. Yeah, as you mentioned, and then so when did you first see Van Halen? Oh, first concert was uh, Anaheim Stadium. That's right. We talked about that. Yes, the parachute yeah. show. Parachute show. Yeah, tell that story because I mean I love when people tell this story because it's you know not too many people have been there or were there. You were there. I was there. I I saw them there. I, S Festival too. I saw them every tour. But um, the the yeah, that was unbelievable because I uh, a friend of mine bought me a ticket. It was all of like twelve bucks or two bucks. I don't know. If concerts were cheap back then. Right. But we had the cheap seats. We were way up high. Way way up high. Right. Right. So uh, I was there really to see Van Halen. That's what I came there for. And unfortunately, I, for I forgot my binoculars because I really wanted to get, yeah, you know, I wanted to get some footage at least through my eyes. So, um, yeah, that was the parachute show. And uh, that was kind of funny because from my vantage point, 
everybody like was watching these parachuters. But to me, I never thought that it was supposed to be Van Halen. I just thought it was parachuters coming in. Right. Even though they were kind of saying that over the speaker. Right. Here they come. And I'm like, what? Well, parachuters are. Because from my vantage point, I could see the van that was driving around picking up the parachuters. Right. And that and the van, it was funny because those guys were landing everywhere. You know, they were not all coming in perfectly in the nice position to get picked up. One over here, one over there. So the van runs over here and he grabs one. Then he goes all the way over to the other side. And from my vantage point, I could see the whole parking lot at the big A in Anaheim. And then he go all the way back the other way and all the way back the other way. And then all of a sudden the van disappears and they show up on stage. I'm like, OK, this is not real. Right, right, right. So, so there, there's something going on here. I guess, you know, maybe it could have happened, but not in the time I saw it. So I knew it was a spoof the second I saw that, right? Right, but, uh, right. After the <laughs> concerts, everybody's asking me, I, just, I can't believe they flew. And I'm like, yeah, I didn't you know, want to spoil their fun. You know? Right, because you were in the upper deck, you said. on the Upper deck. Right hand, yeah. right, would be right field at, at Anaheim? Yeah, I was on right field, yeah. Right, right. So your upper deck, and so you're you're able to see easily behind the stage. I could see everything behind the stage. Right, everything going on back then, all the extracurricular activity and everything. Yeah, yeah. Because I did that video where I went down there to and shot that kind of that yeah. behind there, and and I saw pictures on the news desk, Van Halen news desk, where the stage was roughly. It was kind of center left, maybe. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And it, it was. Um, you know, and it was clear you could easily see behind it, especially yes. if you're up in the upper deck, you know, oh, yeah. huge right. expanse out there in that parking lot behind it. You know, like you said, they're trying to, how long did it take them once they landed to get everybody together and like get it all before the band hit, band hit the stage? Like it was pretty short. Okay. So they did make it seem pretty quick. No. Yeah. Cause I was thinking if they're supposed to be taken off the suits and then they already have their stage clothes underneath, maybe that's possible. But it had already been spoiled for me because I didn't even think it was them in the first place, you know. Right, right. But, uh, but I'll tell you, man, they came out on fire, literally on fire. Um, all the songs were really fast. You know, they were known for rushing. But my gosh. Yeah, I, you know, whoever played on that bill that day, it kind of escapes me who else was on there. But Boston was on there. Boston, oh, Sabbath and Sabbath, Boston Sabbath and Hagar. Sammy? Hey, Sammy Harry, yeah. So Boston came on so late. People were leaving. They were so late that night. That's right. I saw Boston at the Big A twice. But yeah, Van Halen. I mean, everything was played really fast. But you know, it the guitar because it's such a big venue, the guitar would kind of come in and out. You know, it's echoing around. That's not really a venue for concerts. So, you know, you're trying to listen to it and uh, get as much as you can from it. But I'm glad I saw it. I still can vividly, you know, remember the experience. And that, you know, anybody that had to go after them, forget it. Yeah, forget there, it. There is that bootleg running around. Uh, it was apparently on vinyl at one point. Somebody, I saw it. Yeah. It's on the internet. You can find it. It's called Suspicious Performance. <laughs> <laughs> and it's one yeah. of the, it's a bootleg of that show. Uh, with Van Halen and, and man, they, they are killer. I mean, it's it's pretty obviously it's audience recorded. Yes, and you kind of hear that effect that you're hearing where you kind of there's some clarity to it, then it goes goes away and yeah, yeah, it's probably just the the, the size of the place and just, I think it's the size of the place. I think it was a windy day. I think yeah. if I remember, um, it was hot. But my buddies were down on the field, you know, those are the guys that came home, the guitar player friends of mine, and said that this is about where his hand is. His hand was here when he did that lick. I'm like, well, that's interesting. Oh, yeah. And he just happens to be jumping six to eight frets at a time. I'm like, well, there's a lot more to this than I thought. Right. Um, because people don't realize, especially young players who are, who are learning his licks, right? Yeah. <laughs> what it was like. To, it was like having nothing to look at. Nothing. Nothing. I mean, maybe a photo you might see his hand position. Yeah. You, don't, you didn't you know back then. Now we can look at a photo and go, he's playing this or that. But yeah, but then you just had no clue of, unless you were close at a show. Yep. And you could see it, man. And that, I think that's kind of what made me become like a, the Sammy Hagar's up front fanatic. I want to be close at every show so I could see all of this 
detail going on in that yeah. player's yeah. hands. You know, that was something I really got into when I as and still am into like Nuno's coming in in a week, you know, oh, next wow. week. So yeah. Right. And it's G it's GA, you know, so I'm going to get up close, man. I'm going to be there and see this up close. I want to cool. see, you know, every little nuance of, of, of that. And, uh, but yeah, man, it's, it was, it's amazing that we were able to learn what we were. So it's kind of funny when you do learn something, you get it right. You're like, wow, yeah. I did have that right for, you know, somehow. Well, so a good friend of mine was really good at learning stuff note for note. And he, um he had a turntable they put at 16, and I, I don't know how that helped him, but it kind of did. But he would get the notes. So he knew what the notes were. He knew the notes. And then he would figure it out from there as to what the technique was. And he was probably out of this area, probably the guy that was most influential. At, you know, every every neighborhood has or high school has the guy who can do it. Right. Right. He, he his name was Scott Griffith. And he certainly was uh, the guy that got us there. He got us. He got us close. Right, know. right, right. There are people. But, that are, yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. But just because you can do it doesn't mean you can play it. You know, I mean, that's hats off to these people who are the Van Halen, you know, like the tribute bands and stuff like that. I mean, if I start to go down that road myself, then I can't play anything else. And, you know, I just I, I made a conscious effort myself, especially with my band, not to tap. Yeah, right. Try to stay away from the whammy bar, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And try to stay away from, you know, squeals and stuff like that, which is hard. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I, I hats off to the guys who can do it because I, I, I'm amazed at, you know, some people who can really find that feel and deliver it. You know, it's hard, man. It's a lot of work. It really is. It's really work. hard. It's a lot yeah. of work and a lot of maintaining. I, I, when I, you know, learned a lot of these other songs that besides the ones that we all played in high school bands, you know, you really got me and you talk about love. And uh, whatever the other ones might have been from the first album that we could actually play running with the devil, you know, without, <laughs> you know, spending days and days on them. Yeah. Uh, the other songs, though, when you get into your, you know, I'm the ones or whatever, or pop for teacher, just playing that that groove, you know, and playing the way he did that. It's it's trying to learn that is it's the really and you got you do that with your band. And that's really difficult. I'm telling you, that guy was pretty good. Right. <laughs> so you you ran across him at Nam, right? You said in eighty no. whatever it was. Yeah, <laughs> and he and he wrote you a disparaging comment. He did, yeah. So <laughs> that that's that's uh, incredible. So you know, I got to go to Nam. I think it was eighty two. I'm ninety percent sure it was then. And uh, I've told this story so many times, but I was there with all my bandmates and friends, and. Um, we're just walking around the aisles and then somebody sees him and says, Oh my God, that's it. So not to be a stalker. Well, I guess maybe we were stalkers, but we followed him into a guitar booth that sold those little miniature Les Pauls and strats. Wow. Okay. The little teeny ones that he may, may have been the same ones that he ended up using for little guitars or whatever. So, you know, I don't know what kind of brave me, bravery I got for that, but I went up and I, I kneeled down next to him. He was actually kneeling down and he looks straight at me. He goes, got a pick. And I'm like, you're Edward Van Halen. And I'm thinking to myself, you don't carry a pick with you. Right. <laughs> so I reach in my pocket and give him my band pick, you know, striker. I hand it to him and then he, noodles off but he he seemed a little like apprehensive to actually kind of play he was just kind of looking at the feeling maybe me hovering over him was not the best you know place for him to try a new guitar right so um uh yeah so that kind of i kind of like i let him go right, right. <laughs> he, goes, he goes walking off and um we're all all of us are just like oh my gosh can he because think about the at an 82 yeah. You've just seen the biggest rock star on the planet. Right. right I mean, right. unbelievable. It's, it's so, like it's like Nam, you know, whenever you go to Nam, there's always that like Stevie Wonder shows up and Yeah. And it, it's oh. the, it's the, it's like the thing. It 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 yeah. even though it's not all day or it's not all the time, it's like this one moment. And it it's uh an energy that it that it could happen, anything could happen in Nam. Absolutely. Yeah. Anybody could show up at anybody any point. can show up. And it, and it just, it actually blows my mind 
I mean, dude, I've been doing that since I was 19, right? Going to NAM. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. I always say this about NAM. It seems like every year that I go, I meet somebody I've always wanted to meet that I've never had the opportunity to meet. And it and it's just all of a sudden they're right there. Yeah, right. You know, this year it was Tommy Aldridge. I'd never, oh, wow. never met Tommy Aldridge. And yeah. uh, I was in the Yamaha booth just doing, looking. And there he was. And I, he was great. You know, he took a picture. Yeah. Super cool and looked great. I mean, the guy looks amazing, you know, still. Yeah. He's, he's killing yeah. it. Oh, he's yeah. amazing. Incredible. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. Just like, it seemed like every year something like that happens. And back then it was like you never knew if you'd walk around the next corner and run right into Eddie Van Halen or some other giant of the business. Yeah. Or they run into you, which was happening. Right. 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 <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, that's the second. To, yeah. That's happened to me. I was walking around this corner at NAM and I slammed into Steve Lukather. <laughs> right. <laughs> I thought it was so funny. Like, hey, what's up? <laughs> and I, you, we started talking and stuff and he was super cool. But it was like so strange that it just happens like that. It, it does. And, and that that happened to me that day and that we left. Yeah. And we were like we just couldn't believe what we witnessed and we stop at one of those four-way stops at nam yeah that idea yeah right and who do you think runs into right in the back of me and my bass player <laughs> Eddie Van Halen. full speed bam and he's got the dark sunglasses and the schlitz malt liquor and white t-shirt and i don't even think he might have been wearing shoes i think he was but beelining it he was beelining it, right? Right. Trying and, to get and, through. Yes, trying to get through. And I mean, and so we followed him again. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that kind of gets to the second part of the story. Yeah. Which we caught up with him um, at the Kramer Guitars booth. Right. And once again, they were all just kind of standing around watching him. And then once again, I, I guess I got brave or whatever. And yeah, I took my business card in for him to sign it. <laughs> boy, boy, did he. <laughs> right because he you know he would do stuff like that you know? <laughs> like he was he was always trying to be funny like he was he was laughing his butt off oh he yeah. was very happy yes yeah, yeah i mean he he uh he always had sort of a, a mischievous yes thing right it's oh so, yeah like he like if when he was in a great mood he liked to play around like that yeah like he liked to, I mean, it's it's so hard for us to kind of imagine what it's like to be this guy at NAM, right? I know, right? Yeah, yeah. Can you imagine like the personality that you have to have in order to to deal with that kind of attention? It, it had to be difficult. I mean, I look back on it, and I'm not. I don't have. Um, I don't have a lot of photos with famous people and stuff like that. I, I don't have any hardly any autographs. In fact, the only autograph I have is Eddie Van Halen. Right. So, um, and maybe he taught me a lesson when he signed my card. I don't know. But, <laughs> right. But, uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, you know, I think it's very difficult, you know, because you're all of a sudden, especially in his case, I mean, he became the face of rock guitar forever and in 82 the writing was on the wall there's nobody stopping him right. nobody no one's going to come out i mean we can talk a little bit about ingve which is another mind-blowing experience sure but still ed had it all yeah 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 we I, we were talking about ingve the other night because i had mentioned to you that that i had run across this photo of ingve in in the 80s and they had written some disparaging comments about ed and put it on a Yes. Sheet, and it was on the stage. You know, obviously not Ingbe did that. He didn't do that, but somebody in the audience that loved Ingbe did. And, yeah. Okay. And it was basically, you know, saying basically saying that Ed was over. <laughs> you know, Ingbe yeah. was here. And, you know, obviously that never that didn't that didn't become the case. But yeah. that being said, Ingbe was one of those people when because you were there, you saw the first show, right? Yeah, yeah. Talk I saw about that. Show. Talk about that show a little bit. Sure. So that was back in the days with Mike Varney when he had a, uh, in the Guitar Player magazine, you could send a cassette in. Right. And you could, uh, you know, get in the magazine. That was a big deal. 
So I had been in touch with Mike Varney. I had not sent a cassette in. It's important to say that. But I had been talking to him. And he uh, he invited me, put me on the guest list at the Troubadour to see uh, Steeler with their guitar player who was leaving. He was going to be exiting the band. And I had heard you know, about this situation from another friend of mine. Um, and uh, so we all went up to see the show. And uh, I didn't think anything, I'd seen Steeler before. In fact, we played with Steeler. Steeler Striker, right? They dreaded ER ending, we used to say. <laughs> There's a number of those. <laughs> right. right. The dreaded ER ending. Um, but yeah, I was right at the foot of the stage. And Steeler came out and Ingve, he was young and and on fire to say the least. And I watched that and I just I'd never witnessed any kind of guitar playing like that in my life. I right. mean, he his spontaneity it, flying up and down the neck, the bends, even the, you know, the Hendrix-esque pyrotechnics with the guitar and everything. Right. That was a rock show that just was unbelievable. And I think everybody walked out of there with their mouths open. Yeah. Couldn't believe it. Couldn't yeah. believe it, you know, because it, the speed and the agility that he has and the clarity, you know, that's an amazing uh gift you know right. to, to be able to do that and there's some people that can do it but i mean he created it it's his you know yeah when you think about you think about people that are like him today there's still something intangible you know there's a, the combination of his guitar you know he had this thing where he came up with this 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 chain right yeah that, the strat it was very much uh, i think black morris is you know kind of a thing sure. yeah stock yeah. Right. right. And then, the coils. and then of course the Marshall, you know, and then the fact that he was always doing the switching between pickups, which kind of was, Oh, we were all rear. We were rear pickup guys back then. Right. Right. right? Yeah. We were all, nobody didn't, we didn't have front pickups, but when he came along, not long after Van Halen, it, it, it suddenly became like a thing again to go to the front pickup and that's right. And huge different tonal. Uh, yeah, varieties in your guitar because I used to, when I first heard him doing that switching back and forth like he did, uh, I just I just noticed it right away like oh wow okay that sounds pretty cool you know the way yeah. he's going about oh yeah it. yeah I didn't even think about you know the earlier days with like Clapton and you know the the woman tone or whatever I wasn't even in that because Van Halen was my first thing. And uh, so I, I didn't even get, harken back to those things. I, I just heard Ingve do it, and I go, "Oh wow, there's a whole other tonal thing there you can get into." Yeah, well, and and you know because you you've uh, interviewed Kurt, but yeah. you know I I called Mike Varney the other day and I said, "I'm not your guy. I am not your guy. I there is no way I'm going to stand on that stage and even attempt to take his place." Right. Right. But Kurt did the reverse. He went in and called and he said, I am your guy. Right? <laughs> and he, right. he got the spot. He got the spot. And he was. Yeah. You know. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've absolutely. Said, said Kurt and he's, he's amazing, you know, and, and a yeah. great player. And uh, yep. yeah, that, that's, that's, you know, the stories of Ingve and, you know, this was for me, it was, it was Eddie, George Lynch and Ingve were my three yeah. um, that I took probably the most from, you know, I don't I don't really play like any of those guys. I mean, I, in fact, I probably play the least like Eddie Van Halen in a natural in my natural sure. state. Right. Because yeah. to, to me, I think that's why he he stands alone. in the, those three is that I can do the link vein. It sounds pretty close. I can do a little bit of the Lynch and it sounds pretty close. But I can't do Eddie Van Halen. And it and still like if I just do the jump solo, say that's a pretty basic one for most guitar players that do Van Halen. There's still the, there's such a weird rhythmic sense in that the swing of his note choices through that solo. Yeah, it's even though it's what most people consider one of his easier solos, it's still right. difficult to embody his thing. Uh, there's few people you know, so lucky to live in the era that we got to be right. At. I just don't. I, I'm always blown away by that whole. I think that's why when people say he's going to be remembered for 
you know, a century or more or whatever that, that he will be because it's, it, he was so unique, you know, that, that you can't, it's so hard to copy him. Really hard to copy him. And I think how many of us after the, the impact that they had um, looked at our guitar as I would look at mine right now going, what can I do different? Right. Nothing. Right. Nothing. Right. There's nothing. There's really nothing that I'm aware of. You know, I hate to be a killjoy in that. Good right. luck with anybody who can. But man, right. I've I've thought about this for years is what could you bring this instrument out to another level? Right. Um, and, you know, I, I think that's his legacy is he took it. He took it to the end. I mean, you could talk about the guys who put more fingers on the fretboard, but it's just the same thing. And it's not compositions. You know, he wrote compositions with his leads. That's right. the other thing that people, I think, skate by. He's just not playing leads. He's playing compositions of sure. of, of a song. You know, sure. Eruption is it's a composition. Sure, sure. I always think about somebody like uh, Vi, who, who is very compositional. You know, yeah, I, right. and I enjoy that about him and and Satriani really too, and they yeah. were guys that kind of took the Van Halen torch, you know, and kind of created another thing. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Crazy that they did that. It's amazing, man. It really is. It's something. <laughs> so so let's uh let's kind of like tell people, okay, about what we're planning to do. Um, you sure. know, I I kind of alluded this to earlier, but we we're gonna have a round table. Mm -hmm. uh, at some point in the near future uh, with your friend. What's his name again? It was uh, Tony Alamia. Alamia. I, why do I know his name? So he has been around for a while. Um, his company was Alamia Audio. Okay. And anybody in Orange County would remember Tony. He was the only guy that did amp mods other than maybe one other company called Audio Western. And they have long since gone. Tony's still around. He left the business. And went to it went into the broadcast industry, and he's he uh, I know there's the the repair business, right? Early eighties, right? Um, early eighties, and then he actually you know ha has done just fine in his life, uh, and but he's got he was there in the thick of it with the seventies up until about the mid eighties when he exited out, but he was the guy here. Um, I learned a lot from him. I talk to him now at least about once a year. He comes to the guitar shows and uh, yeah, he's uh, he's willing to come on and share his stories of Van Halen, uh, especially uh, post the first album. OK, mm -hmm. and and how uh, what he saw and how he helped and the people involved um, in in the uh, in the back line. Right, right. And uh, yeah, it's it's pretty fascinating. And I think people, when they hear it, they have to also take it a grain of salt where he's not a fan. He's not a, he's not a fan of Van Halen. He's an he's a he's a electrical engineer that simply supplied parts to a company called Van Halen. Right, right, right. What is that? So yeah. that, that the other thing that you we, we talked about, we'll get into that in our conversation when we do this ground table is that he was at the US festival. Us festival and was a witness to some things. Yes. You were at the US festival as well, right? <laughs> yeah, experienced this on the other side of the stage, yeah. right? But real yeah. quickly before we sign off, um, my friend Kurt Granger from here from uh, Birmingham, actually, um, I grew up in Birmingham. Kurt drove out to this US festival, right? And then my other friend um, Ruben Reza was also there, and we did a little thing on the US festival. Uh, the two, the three of us. You, you also say this about that day that it was really a difficult place to be and a hard day. Talk about yes. how, how that was, and and the same once Van Halen came out. So I went to both of them. Uh, the first one, Van Halen, of course, did not play. I should have prepared myself for the second one, but I didn't. It's just a hot, extremely hot, dirty hot and cold experience i mean it's brutal to be in devore whatever time of year that was i don't know it was but it was may, early of the right, may. yeah is that what it was i don't even know sure, yeah. oh yeah no wonder so you know we went there just to see van halen on the rock day right 
Yeah. So <clears throat> it, um, <clears throat> it, by the time they got on, I think most of us were just downright tired. You know, we're, the day had gone long. I think we're out of money. We're out of water. People are burning anything they could find to make heat clothes, you know, tearing trees up. I mean, grass, you know, I mean, they pulling parts of the, 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 the concert area apart just to build something to keep more. And you have like these little pockets of fire burning all over the place, you know, was, I mean, it was just very wild experience, but I just wanted them to come on. I was just, come on, come on, come on, get this thing on. And they, they came on and unlike the video that I hear, the sound was very, I'll just say questionable. Mm -hmm. It, 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 it didn't, I seen them every tour, but this thing was like, everything just sounded off. The guitar did not sound like Eddie's tone at all. It was really missing what we were used to hearing. It was really clean sounding, cleaner than I'd ever heard him play, which I just figured, well, maybe, you know, he's, he, he's slowly turning the gain. Pretty soon we're going to have none at all. You right, know, right. And, um, and then, you know, the band plays through their set and rocked with missing things. Maybe he did it on purpose. Maybe he didn't, but maybe those of us who are fans were like enough with that. I forgot the lyrics thing. Right. Right. We didn't hear the lyrics, Dave, you know, right, right. it was funny, like the last tour, but let's just get it together. But they just, they, it seems like they were struggling to really play a good show. Right. You know? Right. And it, it was kind of late at night. And um, I mean, it was entertaining, but it just didn't have the same, I don't know, it, it didn't have the same Van Halen uh, musicianship and they just weren't together as tight as they normally were. Right. Things like seeing more of the show than actually playing the song. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. So you saw them in 81, kind of what people call their peak, but you yeah. saw all the tours you said, which do you remember one of them sticking out as the D1 or? Uh, actually, this baby was incredible. You have the third tour, 80? Yeah. 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 Women and Children First. I have the program guy. Right yeah, right on. And that was really cool with bringing out the Wurlitzer and yeah. doing that. That was incredible. I, I thought that was uh, one of my favorite shows, probably. Yeah. People say 80, 80 was really powerful. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, not that I would, you know, the Yes Festival is what it is. I mean, it was a, probably a difficult place to get a good sound, although a lot of the other bands had a really good sound. Yeah. But um, we ended up leaving. I mean, I I hated to do it, but I knew from the prior Yes Festival where I was there, um, the end of the night, we finally got to seven to get out of the parking lot. I mean, we just couldn't even get home. All we wanted to do is get home. You know, right, right, so right. I wanted to get out of there early. So I, I didn't see the whole Van Halen set. I think I saw him to his guitar solo. And right. that's where we left. I think that's what we were waiting for. And then we bailed out. Yeah. But, yeah. I, I tell you what, when I did that one show at uh, Monsters of Rock in, uh -huh. in 88, it was the same thing. By the time they hit the stage, man, I couldn't make it. I just I couldn't. <laughs> I mean, I really. I mean, yeah. they, were, they were fine from what I could tell, but I mean, you know, I only saw maybe, I don't know, five, six songs of that 88 show. And I had been there since 11 a.m. through the most brutal heat. Right. In yeah. a freaking bowl that, that you can imagine. And I just couldn't make it, man. I don't know if anybody could have made me stay. And uh, yeah, and that I just, I, I'm glad I was there because it was, you know, there were things like, Metallica being young and yeah, you know, right. And, and I got to see Dokken on their kind of last hurrah, uh, but in their early days. And um, so it was good to see the Scorpions. They were awesome, you know, incredible. Always, always, always incredible. Band. One yeah. of the most consistent bands I've ever seen in my life. I've seen them multiple times and they are always a great show. And and I don't know what it yeah. is, but they, they know how to do that every time. And do. Amazing. So, yeah, Van Halen, you know, obviously a lot of drama over the years that have happened and things that have gone on. But, man, those those early tours from, you know, I saw 84. Mm -hmm. first, yeah. And, and uh, that was the spectacle of probably the 80s, you know, as far as. Right. Show, you know. Yeah. 
You know, I, uh, of course, 81 was the, the, the stage show that, that got me so inspired on the Don Kirshner's thing. Right. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. I oh, wish I, had, system. I wish yeah. I'd seen the flag systems cabinets. That's such a yeah. cool look. I don't know that, you know, they, when they kind of made it more vertical with 84 and then like, they did that at the US Festival kind of again. They were always repurposing those cabinets for, for a number of years there. Yes. That I just I just loved the way that mountain looked. I don't know what it was about that, but something about that whole vibe. Yeah. It was wrong. Whoops. Oh, you froze. Yeah, I'm freezing a little bit. My guy. I've been having some oh, there you are. internet issues. So what do you remember about anything? Okay. Any in particular anything? Um, well, 81, uh, certainly that was right before I got to, you know, uh, meet him at the NAM show. Uh, I mean, he was, he was on, he was on fire, the same thing. I mean, just the thing about Eddie was up in, in those early eighties is that it seemed like, I don't know, this is kind of a funny analogy, but I think he had maybe, you know, he was getting married, right? Yeah. So you got to wonder when he got married, how much more time he had on the guitar. Right. Right. <laughs> right. 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 He was. Yeah. But, you know, there was a dexterity that you hear in his playing that was in the earlier tours. And like each tour, it kind of was a little less. Sure. Up until maybe their last tour. You yeah. know, it was incredible. But you know, I'm trying to think of what sticks out about that more than anything other than just the general showmanship. I mean, it was still incredible. Yeah, I remember listening to the bootlegs of his solo, and it was quite, it was really impressive. It was sort of like he found, he was making that transition between those early solo spots and what you yes. hear later, even way later, you know, like yeah. even the final tours, you you hear elements as he, that thing moves, you know, how he changed his solo spot all the way through. Yes. Yeah. He was always trying to rearrange it, I think, into different, ways and that's quite a feat man just to even put it all together in a way that's cohesive and to oh, show yeah. your different things well and and think about it i think he even said himself it was becoming more difficult for him to come up with stuff that was you know unique and new you know keep people's attention and so his whole solo section you know he couldn't just play eruption every time sure so he, he had to add something to it as he went along you know, right. to keep that solo section vibrant. And he certainly did. I mean, everything he added in from that point on, you know, and of course ending, you know, with the, the hammer on section was brilliant. Sure. sure. Yeah, of course. And then like one of the things I heard in the 81 bootlegs is um, a lot of that uh, stuff we hear with the, where he would do the, you're no good tapping thing where he goes up, you know, which becomes this thing with like Vito and yeah. almost all the guys who tap, at this point in, in time where they're doing fast runs with their, their tap finger across the strings. Right. You know, yeah. instead of, instead of a linear pattern, like eruption, it becomes this cross string thing that he was doing, you know, obviously in that second album. Yep. But you hear it in the solo a lot during the early days, he's doing a lot of that, doing yeah. that, a lot of that. Uh, in fact, you might've even heard it. I'm not sure if you heard it in that first album tour or solo or not, but he was working that idea. Yes. You know, yeah. and you you would hear when he was working an idea and then later it'd end up on a record. Oh, totally. Yeah. Yeah. yeah he was working on that as well. I, one thing I was going to mention about the memory thing is I remember when he started jumping up on the cabinets and the cabinets would rock back and forth. Oh, yeah. And I think they were on either a hinge. Right. Because sometimes they would go so far over. Right. They should fall. But they wouldn't, right? <laughs> right? That was an extremely uh, impressive, you know, part of the solo for him to jump up on those things like that. What year were you? What you talking about? 81? 80? I think that was eighty one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because he would hit them hard. I mean, he'd throw himself up on those things. Right. I was yeah. just listening to his brother's interview that Steve Rosen put out. You know, Alex Van Halen's interview that's been unheard. Mm -hmm. It's unreleased. And um, he talks about in it how athletic his brother was and yeah. that he won the 50 yard dash. He set the record for the 50 yard dash in like junior high and high school. Wow. Yeah. He said, I could never catch him. That's why I tried when I tried to beat him up, he'd run. <laughs> I, yeah. can, I can catch him. He was so fast. 
that totally sounds like a big brother, little brother thing, right? Yeah, right, right. It's yeah. really, it's a really revealing, revealing, uh, a lot of revealing information of the early years of their their relationship and and uh, things that I've heard from people that were there. You know that mm-hmm. he's athletic, and and a lot of people. I mean, Tom didn't say that, but but uh, but his brother did, and said that he was really quick. Yeah. And when you see those videos, even the bootlegs on eighty one, how high this guy is jumping off the ground. Oh. Oh yeah, his vertical jump was like a basketball player, right? Have Have you ever tried to do that jump? No. <laughs> by the no. time By the time I was, I wanted to try. I was too old. <laughs> yeah, I don't remember good, doing it when I was young either, though. Good advice is to not even go there, right? <laughs> <laughs> you definitely hurt yourself. Now I have a friend who is a basketball player, but he's also yeah. a big music aficionado. Yeah. And he does these shots, photos of him doing that jump, oh, yeah, because he can, because he still could get such air, because he's he's a basketball player, and right. a coach actually, and uh, it's amazing, man. Some of these people can do that, but and Eddie could do it like it was, and even when he was older, he was doing it. He was, yeah. I mean, I I have to stand, otherwise I'll fall over. Right, it's, don't it's, move too much. <laughs> man, I appreciate you coming on today and talking for a while. Thank you, yeah. I'm, hey, I, I'm glad we finally did it, you know. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, you know, we've been talking for like a year now, right? Yeah, at least. Yeah, so it's good to have you on finally and Thank talk you. about it. And uh, y'all check out uh, his amps at, at tell them your website. Just Trish. Sure. The, the website for the amplifiers is Mahaffey Amps, which is M A H A F F A Y amps.com. And then the band name is the original striker.com. <laughs> right. In fact, on that site has, uh, our music, of course, and everything on there is the amp. So, I mean, that's always a good way of telling what it sounds like. I was going to say, I heard it. I listened to uh, one of the tracks last night and man, the guitar sound sounded killer. I, you know, I do those tracks, not because I expect to make it in the music industry because I don't, but I do it to demo <laughs> the amps. You know? That's what it's. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm, and then this particular moment, I'm listening to it through my phone. So when it's that- <laughs> Yeah, when it sounds that good off a of phone. I know that sounds fantastic. Oh, you got to crank that thing up because I need to. I need to move it through my my real system at the in the studio in there and see what what I got. Yeah, definitely. Well, thank you so much for having me on. I really thank appreciate. You. it. Finally, we did it. And uh, right on, right. We'll do it again soon with with uh, our guest. Okay, we got to get everybody together on that. But what what were we talking about? April or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, yeah he'll be coming to town, and I'll have him here at uh, at my studio. And uh, yeah, we'll do it then. Let's do it, man. I appreciate it. Now I'll check out Charles Tr- Triss's stuff online and uh, I appreciate you, buddy. All right. Have a good day, man. Thank you. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Bye bye.